So this is where the magic is done. Yeah. Wow. This is Soap Mountain Forge. Soap Mountain Forge. It's interesting, you know what? The uh, you look at blacksmith shops. So uh, your shop's all modern and stuff. When you think about it, the techniques are all the same. Ain't nothing it's, changes. It's pretty much exactly the same. Same heat, same temper, same the whole yeah. nine yards. It's right. All, it's all the same process. Uh, a few things have been modernized. Uh, just. Purely from a business sense, it makes sense to switch to propane from coal. Coal being dirty and a lot of wear. Yeah, a lot. It's hard to obtain. Yeah. And uh, using ovens for tempering, right. and uh, grinding systems for cleaning up. Uh, it just from a business sense, uh, and due to time constraints, this is how we do it these days. Makes but a lot of uh, makes a lot the final of product's the same, and the process to get there is pretty much the pretty same. Much the same yeah. yeah. So Nick, I brought along uh, uh, my friend Bo Beckett, black, really good blacksmith. Him and I forged that out, and he taught me a lot about forge welding. And I got this hafted, and um, so I want to do some pewter inlay. Thought I'd keep it simple, and I was about to go to my shop to do it, and then I thought, heck no, I'm going to meet that Nick Skinner, and he does all kinds of stuff, and. So given I've never done it, I'm hoping you might uh, give me a hand today with that. Well, I can give you a hand with that and teach Perfect. you a bit about that. Perfect. Maybe before we start, you've got some interesting things over here. Can we have a look at them? Yeah, we certainly can. And just set this over here. Uh -huh. Take that, that right guy down here. I'm afraid to touch these. Is it okay? You go right ahead. I love old things. Uh, Nick, I've often said that. I, I like the feel of old tools. I like the smell of old tools even. And that's an original sword, obviously. So... Tell me a bit about that. That's a 1818 uh, star uh, contract saber. Uh, these went into production in the 1820s and uh, probably was used and carried during the Mexican War. Okay. And um, usually bought up and issued to uh, militias. Militias. Yeah. And uh, I purchased this along with the others because I felt, as a contemporary maker, um, I needed to have original items on hand in my shop. Kind of motivates you, you can, yes. rather than just take a guess at it. And by can... studying it, we learn more about the material culture of those times, Perfect. and uh, the construction techniques and finishing techniques of uh, weapons of that time. And this one here, Nick? What that is this? an original first contract, uh, P1804 British, um, Naval Cutlass made by Thomas Craven. So you, you have to do a lot of research to get all this information. Yep, that's it's, actually a lot of it. Yeah. Is the uh, the research and study. So you got some. I see some literature. You you got quite a few volumes and stuff back here on knife making and sword making. And stuff. Yes. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for anyone who wants to do this, uh, either as a hobby or as a living. Uh, and they want to do it uh, historically correct, I highly recommend that they purchase good literature first and foremost. And later on, if you can, and you have the money, and, um, and can afford it, uh, buy actual Originals. physical examples. So this, then what, we, pieces. what we've got here then, Nick, is you've re pretty much reproduced this sword. Roughly, so this one here is the uh, 1804 contract model, mm -hmm. and this predates it. Predates it. Okay, yes. I noticed it was a bit shorter. Yeah, it's a little shorter, uh, and it would be uh, a style typical of the uh, 1790s. 1790s, yeah. so we've gone from 1790 to 1820s. So yeah. over here, we have a piece here. Well, this one's got a nice harness with it. Yes, so I'm, I'm also, uh, aside from being interested in uh, North American and uh, British 
colonial weapons uh, have uh, a real interest in the arms of uh, the Middle East and of uh, Georgia, Russian Georgia. Okay. And uh, these arms are called a Sashka. Sashka? Yeah. So they're a uh, type of uh, saber that we see um, come out during the 18th century and uh, they were carried by the Cossacks. Wow, this is crazy. That's a, a lot of work. Beautiful piece of, even that's what I want to replicate in that handle I brought to you. Yeah. See the color of that? I want to get that nice uh, straight maple coming out of that. Well, their works of art, Nick, that's for sure. And uh, this is just another one, but it's got more of a curve to it. That That's one there has uh, more of a curvature to the blade, yes. But it just look, looks darn dangerous in the wrong hands, or should I say in the right hands, it's, it's dangerous. It's sharp, too. Oh, look at the curve on that. And and um, so that same Cossack that's carry, a Cossack. Yep, just that's a, earlier, later than the straight one? Uh, <clears throat> No, they both be, it's it's kind of a regional thing uh, with the blades. Um, you'll also find that uh, they used in their sabers a lot of import blades. Mm -hmm. So my idea with the design of this blade was to imitate more the uh, curvature and shape of a shamshare. Okay. So uh, I was going more for an ottoman touch with this blade. I'm going for the curved one. Well, <laughs> if I was buying today, I'd take the curved guy. It looks like it might be even a little more like filled with the straight one. <laughs> they both they both work the same. Uh, I'm sure. But one works better in the thrust, the other one's better for cutting. And even the leather work, I notice you've got an original, um, this original sword here. I'm glad you're letting me handle these. Some people wouldn't even wouldn't want you handling these museum pieces, but this is an original one as well, right? Yes, that's and, a, that's a uh, French naval cutlass. And what would sort of the era the states from? That one there is in 1833. Eight, you know the exact year? Yeah. From serial number or style or? They're usually marked. Oh, they're marked. Yeah, they're marked oh. right down the spine. So this one here was made in 1840, but this is the 1833 model. That's crazy. And uh, it, it differs very little from the uh, 1801 model okay. from the Napoleonic Navy. And this is actual buff leather. Yes. Here. Covered with a shellac. Wow. Oh. So, you, I mean, your leather work is second to none as well in terms of the, I mean, you're using a different leather, but you try to replicate the look. Yes. And that's where these original pieces come in like this. So to me, um, the sheath to me is more valuable than the sword. Yeah. Um, the survival rate of leather, period leather work it's is, like, uh, it's not very much of a kicking around these days. No, it's like any leather. You look at Civil War swords, you can find them, but try to find the scabbards, try to find the leather, the cross straps, the cartouches. Yeah. And they're all rotted away where yeah. the steel, you know, unless it was buried, um, well, even sometimes buried, it, it tended to survive. Yeah, I noticed over here, Nick. You just grab these. Uh, this got an original brown vest there, right? Yeah. You mind if I have a look? Go right ahead. Wow, this is uh, this is beautiful. Uh, again, the original stuff just fascinates me, Nick. So we've got a, an original brown vest here, right? Yeah. Um, in what to where you said third pattern, right? It's a third pattern, yeah. And uh, what what year are we talking about? Uh, right? This one here has eighteen hundred shopkeeper stamps on the uh, stock. And uh, the model of it is the, or the, the variant of third model is the uh, 1793 model. So it may very well have been used in the in the War of 1812. War of 1812, uh, war with France, yeah, Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't know for what continent where it was uh, where it was fought, but somewhere in there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so we, we had a discussion about finishing and how, um, like both Nick and I, we like to reproduce things that people used in that time period. Yeah. And so Nick with his knives and us with our buildings and fireplaces and such. And one of the things we talked about was how they we tend to is trying to recreate these is over finish things. Yes. Right? Yeah. So maybe talk a bit about the finish on this guy. Right? So the uh, the finish on these. 
uh, it would be a, just a natural oil finish um, and to um, shape it and smooth this wood down uh, they didn't use sandpaper at that point in time uh, that's a fairly modern invention um, it would be scraper finished and if you uh, study these closely if you look close at the comb on this you can see the marks from the uh, card scraper yeah you actually yeah. can eh? that's yeah. pretty neat so over here you've got um you've got another one over here nick maybe you can yeah. look at that so this one this is one you're working on at the present time here i'm just going to give that to you so i don't damage it. yeah so this particular gun here um it's a uh, my copy of a Gillespie rifle of North Carolina. Uh, it would be a typical uh, southern mountain rifle of the uh, you know, like the 1820s, 1830s. And uh, the finish on this is done very similar to that brown bass. So just it's all used scrapers. It's all scraped down mm -hmm. so with a uh, card scraper. And some oils, natural oils. Yeah, I'll use. Uh, of what they call a burnish oil on this one. I love the, um, I don't know if I'm going to do that. Um, I love the fact that, well, the simplicity, right? So no yep. butt stock. No, uh, no plate on it. Hand forged, um, hand forged trigger guard here and trigger yep. and all those bits. Yeah. The simplicity. And yet the people that use these, uh, what on the surface looks pretty crude that use these in that time period, they were deadly accurate with the name. They were. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's got a sort of a target shooter's barrel. She's a heavy, she's a heavy old barrel. Girl. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we can uh, have a look at my 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 axe that I brought my pole axe and see if we can kind of get a a good finish on that. Oh, I think we can do that. Give it a better try. I'm interested to see how they did it. Now we're going to use uh, some modern methods here as well. Yes. That uh, we were talking the other day. So. We're going to make a paper mold, essentially. Yeah, so we'll make a, a paper mold around it. Um, I call it the dam. It's, uh, it's, it's basically just a, a dam made of paper to hold back the uh, molten pewter. Uh, pewter, I've discovered, cools faster than paper can burn, especially in a uh, when you're doing a pour like this or on a uh, some of the Frontier knives I make, mm -hmm. uh, the pewter furls. They're done, it's the same concept. Uh, this will dam this up all the way around. There'll be a hole cut in each one, and we'll make a little funnel, just like a cast and a ball, yeah. and we'll leave a little sprue behind that you yeah. have to cut off. And then uh, we'll trim down the roughness, because I'm going to let this stand proud a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll trim some of that down on that grinder over there, and then you can file it down and scrape it and or sand it the way you want it. Perfect. Yeah. And then off to some acid and get our stain, pull out those stripes, and we'll have her finished. Yeah. Got to make a sheath for it. Yeah. It'll be a pretty axe when you're done. Good. Look for it. Feels good in my hand. The balance is nice, and I'm quite pleased with how that turned <laughs> out. And I don't think you're going to disappoint, Nick. I hope not. <laughs> Shall we get at her? Yeah. All right. So, Nick, you're using some modern stuff, obviously, but um, we're trying to, or talking the other day about speculating on that they didn't have. Uh, paper like we know it today but they had parchment paper so do you suppose that's what they used for forming this mold i it's it's purely speculation but they could have used a uh, parchment paper like that um or um i at times thought about trying it with leather to see how it worked that would be an interesting um, experiment too and you could reuse it yeah with the leather you could just reuse it um Especially if you if you were to put the smooth side, the the animal, the hair side, if you would, or the yeah. smoother side of say split leather, and and put that inwards, yeah, you should get a pretty good form. Yeah, I I think so. Uh, it would be worth a try anyway. Uh, <laughs> call that uh, we could call that uh, pursuing a little bit of uh, experimental archaeology. Experimental archaeology, right yeah. there. All right, the next one I bring down, we'll we'll, we'll try that. We'll try some different ones. Yeah, right? we'll try that. I think that's a great idea. Heck, even uh, you know, I get thinking about this now. If 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 it if it cools faster than paper burns, is why we can use it. Then perhaps um, uh, a thin laminated piece of birch bark 
I thought of that too. Um, there's no reason that wouldn't make a mold and you could secure it with, with leather thongs yep. to hold it in place, cut a little hole in it and pour your molten pewter in. Even some hemp cord or something like yeah. that. center it. Better to have a little bit too much tape than not enough tape because we don't want a damn blowout. That'll mark where we put our little pour spout. So, so what are we up to now, Nick? We're just cutting out uh, a hole on the top of each of those channels so we can uh, build up another little tape dam to make the pour spouts and pour the pewter through. Perfect. Pour down through here. We came up this spout. Mm. So now we're going to let this cool off. We're going to see if we accidentally poured a band through this one. Yeah, on this on side. That side. Yeah. We may have them all poured. We may have them all poured. Say that's a good sign right there. <laughs> 